Hi everybody, welcome back. We're doing exercise two on the alternator, com alternating compressors when loading is light. So we're in the Logix Pro dual compressor student exercises, exercise two. I'm gonna start from scratch on this one um, instead of picking up where we left off on the other. So in this case, we're going to use, each compressor is going to take its turn, bringing the storage tank back up to pressure. Um, we're going to use PE1 again. We'll continue to utilize for this purpose. And setting, settings will remain the same as those used in the previous exercise. Um, they were 120 and 20 on PE1. That's not what I'm going to use. I'm going to use 40 and 5 because I'm trying to get through this relatively quickly. And I don't want to have to wait for it to pump up to 120 PSI the first time. Um, also, I'll be regulating this flow, the outflow of air coming out of the compressor for the uh, in the interest of saving time. So. I'll make that, I'll change those settings too as we run so it goes through quicker. Um, the task of alternating back and forth between loads is sometimes referred to as a load toggle function, and there are numerous methods to accomplish this in relay logic. In this exercise, however, you are asked to limit yourself to only using only basic relay type instructions when creating your solution. I take this to mean only things that are in the bit tab, simple relays. So latch, unlatch, one shots, um, XICs, XIOs. Uh, that's what I take that to mean because there's a lot of other ways you could use counters and timers and uh, MEQs and all kinds of other stuff to do this. But I, I assume that they mean they want it as simple as possible. So that's how I'm going to do it. Um, download it to the PLC and test it. Then it has you adjusting the flow rates and all that. So we're not going to do the flow rate part just because it's kind of a uh, a lot to fit into a reasonably length video to begin with. Um, so yeah, all the same stuff. We need all the lights to work, stop, start to work. Um, and if you're not really comprehending what they mean by sharing the load, so when the switch makes one time you want motor uh, zero, zero, or motor one, I guess if you want to call it motor one on the left, they label motor, this one motor two, and then the initial motor, they don't label motor one, they just call it motor. So on the left would be motor one, you want that to pump it up until the pressure switch shuts off once. The next time it calls for pressure, you want it to call motor two, and motor two will pump it all the way up on its own. The next time you want it to go back to motor one and have that one pump it back, back up all the way on its own. So the trick is having it do something different when it's receiving the same input each time. It's only ever receiving the signal from this one pressure switch, but one time you have to have it tell this motor to run, and then alternately the next time you need to tell it to tell the other motor to run. So you only have one input and you have to make it do two different things basically. So that's the flip-flop part that they're talking about. So let's go through here and add some rungs quick. I always try to just keep hitting uh, the rung button there and it never wants to add rungs like you think it would. There it goes. Now we're getting it. Um, so let's do our run circuit up here, up top. Same as we did in uh, exercise one. There's probably a quicker way to drag these on here, but this is the way I'm doing it. That's gonna go there. This is gonna go here. We're gonna put a contact out here called, let's call it the run light. Um, I'll assign it first. And then name it. When I drag it here, it should drag the name with it. And I'm going to put the start button here and the stop button. Oh, stop button there. I'm going to name this start. I'm going to name this stop. Okay, now we got our run light. Um, what do we want to put next? Our motors. Um, Trying to put all the outputs up here together if I can. So this is going to be motor one. This is motor two. And they're going, or that's not what I want. I want to put the lights on there, sorry. That's going to be motor one light, compressor one. That's going to be compressor two. And they're going to be tied to the outputs of the motors. So the compressor one light should label these so it's easier to follow along. Oops. 
So that's our run light, our C1 light, our C2 light. The C1 light is going to come on whenever motor 1 is on, so we can tie that to the output. So anytime the output for this motor is true, the motor will run, and that's when we want this C1 light to come on. And the same with here. And I can label this one motor 1, then we, move, we add the output for motor 1 later. It'll drag that name in there. And maybe this one motor 2. So now we have all our lights and our buttons on our control panel, right? Our stop, stop button, start button, uh, run light, C1, C2. Um, now let's do our outputs for our motors. That guy and that guy. First one's gonna be motor one. It's gonna be motor two. And it drug, because we put name them up here, it drug the, uh, naming down for it. And what are we going to need? We're going to need the run light. We're going to need the pressure switch. And let's just put both those on here because they're both going to need to be have a call for pressure. And they're both going to need uh, the run light because we only want these to, we only want the compressors to run if the system is enabled, right? If the start button was pressed. This is going to be the pressure switch. So we only want one or the other to run if the pressure switch is saying that the pressure is below what it should be. Um, so you see right now I have the pressure set to 40 and in the tank it's 37.6. So it's below that two, two PSI span. Um, so it would have to be at 38 before it would stop um, or it'd have to drift down below 38 before it calls for pressure again, which it has, it's 37.6. And you see right now it's showing that this these runs are true. So this it would be calling for pressure right now. Um, so the other thing that we're going to need to put in here is one of these is going to have an XIC and one of these is going to have an XIO. And the reason for that will be apparent right off the bat. But let me label this. So that's those. This is um, the the meat and potatoes of trying to get this thing to run right is how you get it to flip back and forth between the two motors here. Oh, you know what? I drug uh, the wrong motors in the wrong spot. There we go. Let me get rid of this wrong. So now we have all of our outputs, um, our run light, C1, C2, motor one, motor two. That's all of our outputs and all of our inputs, start light or um, start button, stop button, and your pressure switch. So all our inputs and all our outputs are all on here. Um, now we need this guy. We need to trigger a way to flip flop. So basically this bit right here is either going to be on or off, right? So if it's, if the bit is false, then you will have, this will be true and it'll allow motor two to run. If the, if this bit, cause I'm going to assign these to the same location, the same memory location. Um, so we just have to flip-flop that memory bit back and forth so that after the pressure cycle goes one time, it'll allow this motor to go and then it'll flip the bit so that it'll make this rung true and the other motor will go and it'll just keep flip-flopping back and forth. Um, probably doesn't make a lot of sense as I try to explain it, but you'll see, um, you'll see here as soon as I dra drag everything together, what I'm trying to do. So this one shot, I'm going to put a memory bit out here. So it's going to be an output coil symbol, and I'm going to address it to my first B3 binary. I call these memory bits, but um, that. Oh, also, if you're using a one shot, it needs its own memory location, so it knows what state it was in the. Um, it knows what state it was in the scan previous to the current scan, because it only fires when it's on a. Oh, that one, you're done only fires when it's on a um, uh, rising. Like last cycle, it was a false, and this cycle, it's this scan, it's true. That's the only time it's going to uh, be true out to the end of this wrong. So I'm not going to get super in-depth in that. After this video, I'm going to have to make a video explaining exactly how these rungs down here that I'm setting up work, because they are confusing unless you really understand the order operation of 
how the process works, like evaluates all the inputs, looks at the logic, updates the outputs, and then goes on to the next rung. Um, unless you really have a good understanding of how that process works, this logic that I'm putting down here on these next two rungs is not gonna make much sense. Um, put this here, try to put that there. It's not going to go there in the end, but I'll put it there for now. This is going to get moved here, and this is going to get put here. And the output of this is also, this is going to be the bit that we flip that's going to be tied to this. Um, we're also going to make that a memory location. We're going to make that B302, I believe. Let's see, 01. Yeah, I think that's the one we're on. Um, then these. It's going to be tied to there, and that's going to be tied to there. This is going to be tied here, and this is going to be tied here. So before I check it, um, let me just label this. I'm going to call this the OSR. One shot rising is what OSR stands for. This is the output associated with that one shot rising. That's the word I was trying to think of earlier. It needs a memory location in it so it knows if it's on, if the scan that it's currently on is on the rising edge, meaning it went from false to true just in this scan. And the only time this is going to fire, as some people say, or allow, uh, allow the input side of this run to be true is when the last scan it was false and the scan it's true. Or if you want to look at this location, um, this is B300. This thing always floats down to the bottom. Um, this location. If it was a zero, meaning false, the scan previous, that's why it needs a memory location so it can look and see, so it can retain what it was last scan. Otherwise, if it didn't have memory location, it wouldn't know what it was from scan to scan, the previous scan. Um, if last scan it was a zero and the current scan it's a one, that means it, it's on a rising edge. That's the, the instance where it went from false to true. And that is the one time that is going to allow um, the input side of this rung to be true and to uh, energize the output side or make the output side memory location a one in this case from zero. This should work. Uh, so these are the two that are going to flip flop this bit here. And we're going to name this flip flop bit. Sounds good enough. Um, this is going to be the bit that actually change states, changes states every time the uh, pressure switch goes on and off. Um, so I'm going to put this address here. I'm going to put this address here. So assuming all this is going to work first try without me checking anything in between as we we're setting it up, um, the idea is this pressure switch is going to go from low to high and that is going to make the one shot go from low to high or false to true, which is going to enable this B301, which these two are tied to. Whenever that fires, it's basically going to make this output the opposite of what it currently is. If it's currently high, when that fires, it's going to make this low or false. If it's currently false or off or however you want to put it, a zero in this output memory location, um, it'll make it a one whenever that one shot fires. Um, I'll go into why that is in the next video because it's kind of a long explanation. Um, so I'm assuming all this is going to work properly um, right off the bat. Just, you know, everybody makes mistakes. I may have mislabeled something here, so we'll see. We'll download it, put her in run mode, and hit the start button. So our run light works, our C2 is running, and our stop works. That's good. Um, let's let it run and see. So after C2 shuts off, you should see this bit go high. If everything works, right? It's going to shut off when we get to 40 PSI. Almost there. There. So this bit went high, which means now motor one, there it went. It's kind of quick. So that made this bit right here. Oh, see it flipped back and forth. Every time the compressor shuts off, every time that compressor shuts off, PE1 goes high, which fires the one shot and that flips the output of B302, which is right here. Both of these are tied to B302. One is um, we have an XIC and XIO. 
So one of the two of them, no matter what state this is in, one of the two of them is going to be true and allow that motor that's in that rung to be energized when PE1 calls for pressure again. So you can see that one just ran, it shut off when this leaks back down, and it calls for pressure again, the other one will come on, and we see our opposite CE2 light is working. When this one kicks back on in a second, we'll see the CE1 working. Yep. So everything worked as I thought it would. Um, this logic here, it's one thing just to copy you know, what I wrote here, but if you go like individual scans, you can get into a state down here where, let me see, so you can put it into step. I don't want to get too deep into it again because I'm going to go in deep um, on the next. In the next, um, I gotta wait till it gets higher, higher in pressure before I uh, put it back in step mode. Forty into oh, it's not in start right now. So let me start here. Um, single scan. I'm gonna wait until it gets really close to 40 and I'm gonna to try to catch it and put it in step mode so we can go to single scan. So I'm trying to catch it at like 39.8. Oh, did I catch it in time? Yeah, I did. Oh, maybe I didn't. Let's see here. No, I didn't. Sorry. Put it back and run, hit start again. Trying to catch it at like a 39.87 or something because I didn't catch it in time last time. There you go. Now if I do a single scan, oh, it dropped out. Hmm. It's dropping out my uh, start button every time I sw switch over to step mode. But you can step through this one scan at a time as you go. And there, if you step through it one scan at a time to try to figure out what's going on here, there's multiple occasions where um, there's two things in series over here that are true and the output is false or vice versa. You'll have, you won't have two, two instructions in a row that are true. There won't be an obvious reason why the output would be energized, but it will be energized if you step through one scan at a time. And that has to do with the way the one shot interacts with this rung below it. Um, again, I'm going to make a separate video because that's um, a lot to put in as one one single video. Um, but yeah, the way I did it was just put all my outputs, um, get all my outputs and inputs, and then just design some kind of logic that is going to make the PE1 pressure switch trigger um, an event that is going to flip which motor comes on the next time. So if that makes sense, that's that's essentially what I, what I came up with. Before I saw that it said uh, must use simple like relay logic and bit logic, I was thinking about doing a count up and then just having it evaluate, having each motor evaluate whether the accumulated in the counter is even or an odd number. Like motor one comes on if that counter is even and motor two comes on if that counter is odd and just having the PE1 increment that counter up by one every time. So every other time it called, it would be, you know, it would the accumulated on the counter would have an even number and every other time it would have an odd number. So that would switch the motors. That was the first thing I thought of. Um, but then I saw you had to use a simple bit, so it took a lot more work and a lot more uh, research to figure out a good way to do this. And this seems like the simplest way that I've found so far. So hopefully that is helpful.